Welcome to Dear Diaspora, a podcast celebrating the African diaspora and the change makers, innovators, and entrepreneurs working to make our world a better one to live in. I'm your host, Ndula Koa. Let's get started. So before I introduce the next guest, don't forget to leave a review, subscribe, and rate on Apple Podcasts. It makes a huge difference and One key way that it does that is people are more likely to check out an episode or two if they see that there are ratings and if they see that people are actually listening to the content and enjoying the content. And uh, one way to show that you enjoy the content is by leaving a review. So for everyone that's left a review, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if you are listening on any other podcast listening platform, please make sure you follow the podcast so you're notified each Sunday when new episodes come out. And lastly, if you're listening on Spotify, you can actually share the podcast that you listen to on Instagram stories, just like you would a song. So if you're listening to Dear Diaspora on Spotify, you can share that in your Insta stories and I will repost. Um, So of course, tag Dear Diaspora and I will repost and really appreciate you spreading the word about the podcast. Happy Sunday, Dear Diaspora fam. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode 22, the second official episode of the new year. For this episode, I did something a little different, and I will be actually reviewing this really great book I just read called Africa's Business Revolution, How to Succeed in the World's Next Big Growth Market. So this book was sitting in my Amazon cart for the longest because... I I do this thing where I have a super strong interest in a book and then I'll buy it, read a couple chapters, and then I get distracted. And so I really didn't want to do that with this one. So I waited until I finished a couple other books um, I was working on uh, before ordering this one. So super excited that I finally got my hands on this one over the winter break. And um, I thought that I would share some of the really, really interesting insights um, that were shared in this book. Like I, almost every page just blew me away. Um, I am super interested in doing business on the continent and um, so are many of you. And so I thought it would be great to kind of just break down some of the main themes and trends that are shared in this book um, for all of you to just kind of, you know, increase your knowledge about what it takes to really succeed on the continent. Africa's Business Revolution is co-authored by Achaleke Mutsachironga and George Devo. So a little bit about them, Achaleke is first like a pretty big deal. He's the chairman of McKinsey and Company's Africa practice and leads the firm's expansion across Africa. So if you aren't familiar with McKinsey and Company, um, they are one of the largest, if not the largest, um, consulting firms in the world. They have a presence in over 60 countries and they consult organizations across the private, public and social sectors. Mutsa Chironga is an executive at Nedbank, one of South Africa's largest banking groups. He was previously a partner at McKinsey and Company, where he served banks in a dozen African countries mostly capturing growth opportunities. And lastly, George Devo is a senior partner at McKinsey & Company and former managing partner of its Africa and Japanese offices. So he helped build the firm's consumer insights and analytics capabilities. So these three gentlemen are more than qualified to write about how to really succeed in Africa. As far as business goes, uh, they've all helped organizations navigate doing business on the continent for decades, and they put together a really great book. So the goal of the book is to essentially provide an overview of what it takes to succeed in Africa. It was really written for global business executives looking to expand their operations in Africa, and also for those that are just seeking a roadmap to access the continent. So for those of you who've been listening for a while, you know that I am Zambian and have now lived in the U.S. for about 14 years, so over half of my life, and I have a strong interest in doing business on the continent or contributing 
somehow to the continent um, in some way. And so I'm learning as much as I can and hope to be able to do that in the near future. And so for me um, and for people, you know, like me who have some sort of interest in, um, you know, either moving to the continent, doing business um, on the continent or just even um, investing on the continent, I believe books like these are super necessary and should be read by anyone who has an interest. Um, It was super insightful. And for those of you that know, I studied international studies for my undergrad and I recently got my MBA. And I've never come across um, the majority of the information that was shared in this book. So for those um, who really, like I said, have an interest in doing business on the continent, I really encourage you to check out this book um, and really learn from it. I, during my undergrad and even during, you know, grad school, I always wanted a, a class on, you know, how to do business in Africa. Like I never had a class like that. If I took an international economic development class, it was more focused on um, you know, um, going over like the problems and the issues that are facing, um, a lot of developing nations. And it never really came to the point where, um, they had like actual examples of, you know, companies being successful on the continent and what exactly they, they did to be successful. And so, uh, yeah, there was never a class that was about doing business in Africa. And so, I think that it's imperative that people who have an interest um, are informed about what it takes to succeed there because you really, you can't just like cut and paste your business model and think it's going to work on the continent. Africa has 54 um, very different countries. Um, What works in Nigeria or Ghana may not necessarily work in Zambia or Zimbabwe. And that's just the reality. Um, It's just how that's just how things work. Just like you wouldn't expect a super successful, um, New York, um, let's say retailer to do really well in like rural Nebraska. Like that's just not how things work. You have to, um, be really thoughtful about your product and, or your service and what problems, um, it really has the ability to solve for the consumers, um, in the market that you're trying to enter. I always think back to what one of my guests said in episode 13. So that was with African Tech Roundup's um, Andile Masugu. And he said that in order for you to be really successful on the continent, you can't just hop in and out of the ecosystem. So if you want to be successful doing business, you have to have a presence there. You have to spend a significant amount of time learning about consumers, learning about their needs, learning about um, people's pain points, and learning about whether or not your product would actually fit, um, you know, this market that you're targeting. And you know who does a really great job of doing this? Um, Chinese companies. Uh, A lot of Chinese companies, you know, have had a presence um, on the continent for decades now. And one example that I think of is the Technophones. And if you go back to episode 13, we kind of talked a little bit about them, but they, at the moment, sell almost half of all cell phones on the continent. So they have a super large market share, and it's really, really interesting because they are playing the long game. A lot of the cell phones that they sell are, they're not, you know, like your iPhones or your Samsungs, um, They um, are very simple phones, very affordable um, because they know that they know their market. You know, they understand what people can afford. And the fact that they have such a large market share, um, you know, over time, as people um, as people's incomes uh, rise, as people start to make more money and they have more money to spend on technology and gadgets, Um, if people are already familiar with, you know, techno phones, what they're going to do is they're going to want to upgrade to, um, 
to some of the more expensive phones. And so even though, you know, Techno has, you know, a wide range of um, cell phones and they might be selling, you know, the cheaper ones for now, eventually they're going to be able to sell more of the more pricey phones. Um, And they are um, really smart because they are, you know, they have a presence and they um, are going to have that brand loyalty and that brand recognition. And so if you want to succeed, um, that's the approach that you're going to have to take. And that's something that um, kept coming up throughout the book. Like you have to play the long game. You, you know, just can't go Um, there this year let's say and think you're going to pop like you know you have to take your time you have to study the market you know know who your customer is Um, and so this book really um, really really doubles down on that and I really um, I really enjoyed it and so and so the rest of the episode is going to focus on some of the long-term growth trends that um, the authors identified um, after doing all this amazing research. And so these five trends, um, they call them the big five, are mapped out um, super beautifully in the book, and I will be breaking them down. And so before I get into that, there's a stat in the book that really like just kind of blew my mind. Um, so the authors surveyed, um, a bunch of companies, um, and interviewed a bunch of, you know, executives that are, you know, currently, um, operating businesses on the continent. And so after surveying these execs, um, they asked them, you know, how many billion dollar companies they thought, uh, were on the continent. And so they were asking how many companies in Africa have, annual revenues of over a billion dollars and most of the executives guessed you know 50 75 you know some maybe 150 but the actual number like will shock you it's 400 like 400 companies on the continent um make over a billion dollars a year um in revenue and that number actually like I looked up a couple YouTube videos um, from some of the talks that the authors have um, had and that number is now at 438 and so I bring up that stat because I feel like a lot of times um, people aren't talking about these things Um, a lot of people associate doing business in Africa with you know, um, corruption or, um, disorganization or, um, you know, people just think of, you know, the negative things, poor infrastructure, all that. Um, but then despite that, there are hundreds of billion dollar companies on the continent. And so I really think that speaks to, um, how successful you can be if you are just super strategic about how you do business in Africa. All right, so let's get into these top five growth trends, the big five. Number one is the young, fast-growing urban population with a lot of unmet demands. There were so many fascinating um, numbers and figures like shared in this section, um, including one that said that the median age in Africa is 20. There are so many young people on the continent. Like that is crazy. Like other parts of the world, you have, you know, these super, um, old people, um, you know, populations are aging. People are living, you know, a lot longer, you know, in, um, like the, the U S for example. Um, but on the continent, there are a lot of young people. So in Nigeria alone, there are more babies born each year than all of Western Europe. Like let that sink in a little bit. So if you are a person, for example, who has any sort of product or service that caters to babies, to moms, to toddlers, to kids in general, and you are looking to expand to Africa, um, The first place that you might look is Nigeria because there are a lot of babies um, that are being born in Nigeria every year. 
And so the population is growing. Um, currently, Africa is um, at 1.2 billion. And by 2050, we'll be at 2.4 billion. So the population is expected to double. Um, and at the end of the century, over 4 billion people will be on the continent. Um, that is just mind blowing to me. Um, so that means that one out of every three people on the earth will be an African. Yeah. So let that sink in for a minute. Um, so if you're looking to do business in Africa, there will never be, um, a shortage of labor, a shortage of, uh, people looking to buy your products. Um, you know, how you capitalize on this, however, is what will be key. Um, there are a lot of unmet needs on the continent. So you, um, as a business owner or, you know, someone looking to expand to the continent will have to figure out, um, you know, which of those unmet needs, um, you would like to, to meet. Additionally, the section talks about urbanization and how, um, Africa is really the fastest, um, urbanizing region in the world. So more than 80% of, the growth that's going to be happening in Africa will actually be happening in cities. And so when urbanization happens, um, you know, traditionally when it, you know, happened in, you know, Western countries, um, and other places, um, that leads to increases in productivity, increases in consumption, um, increases in just labor, um, the, you know, the labor pool is expanded and it, it grows. And that all means that people will have more money um, to spend on your goods and services. So a big takeaway with this is to focus not just on what consumers are buying today, but what they will be purchasing in, you know, the next 5, 10, or 15 years. Like I said before, you know, um, that long game. Um, even if, you know, at this point, um, African consumers aren't ready for a particular product in the next 10 years, they might be, you know, the perfect market, um, for that product. And so all the new babies, um, you know, being born will need access to housing, um, access to clothing and access to food, um, access to, you know, appliances, uh, loans, um, you know, all those things, um, I think are just super important to think about. Um, and so that number one trend, um, you know, the young, fast growing urban population that has, you know, just all these unmet needs, like you could be that person, um, or you could be that company to meet the needs, um, of this growing, um, urbanized population. All right, so the second trend is Africa's coming industrial revolution. So if you didn't know that Africa has an actual like manufacturing sector, um, now you know. Um, there are a lot of goods um, that are actually produced in Africa. Um, if you go back to that episode 13, I actually talked about... Um, the Mar Group and how they are producing the first um, completely made in Africa cell phones. And so um, you see a lot of that happening. Um, there are a lot of like garment uh, manufacturers, um, bottle manufacturers, um, automotive manufacturers as well. Um, and so I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, and I'm just now learning um, a lot, um, even about like some of the, you know, more, um, like the garment man manufacturers and things in Ethiopia. And so anyway, so Africa's current manufacturing output is at $500 billion and it actually has the opportunity to double its manufacturing output to 1 trillion by 2025. Um, so that's in five years. And this book was written a couple years ago. And so, it would be really cool to see um, just more um, manufacturing happening on the continent and more, you know, made in Africa things. Um, I think that would be great to see. And so a lot of this growth um, is going to 
um, come from actually meeting the needs of African consumers. And um, a lot of this manufacturing is going to be intra-African. Um, so it's going to be for African consumers and not necessarily for exports. Um, like it has a potential, obviously, to um, become very focused on exporting. But um, there are like, you know, the trend before mentioned a lot of unmet needs on the continent. And um, the fact that we um, are currently working on building up our capacity to manufacture goods for the continent, um, I think is really great to see. Um, so countries like Ethiopia are leading the way. Um, the book talks um, about Ethiopia and uh, one of their industrial parks called Hawassa Industrial Park. And so they actually produce shirts, jackets, and socks for um, labels like Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein using machines that run mostly on hydroelectric power. Um, that is like revolutionary. Um, and really, um, I really hope that's a model that a lot of, um, African countries, um, use and follow. And so Ethiopia is really cool because their government is very focused on improving the infrastructure, um, so that they can continue to expand their manufacturing sector. So they are focused on building roads. They are focused on, um, you know, building airports and things like that. And so that's really cool to see. Um, and then the book goes on to share stats about um, the Chinese-owned manufacturing firms um, currently operating in Africa and how they actually, um, well, as of like about two years ago, they handle about 12% of Africa's industrial production um, so that was eye opening for me because I honestly thought the number was higher, um, because, you know, of all this like panic that a lot of people have been having about the Chinese and their presence on the continent. Um, I thought that that number would be bigger, but the thing is, I feel like the, even though it's only 12% at this moment, um, they have the um, capital and the resources to expand, um, fast. And so that is something that, um, I think is important to watch, um, because if we are going to, um, meet the needs, um, of African consumers, it would be great for, you know, these manufacturing, um, firms to be owned by Africans and not, you know, 100% by foreigners. And so that was something that kind of opened my mind, um, uh, opened my eyes a little bit. And so after interviewing um, a lot of these manufacturers, um, after the authors, you know, had conversations with them, they actually um, shared that 93% of the revenues from um, their manufacturing outputs um, were from local or regional sales meaning these products that they are making are for African consumers. And so I think, again, that just speaks to the fact that people need stuff. You know, people need things, people need food, people need clothing. Um, and, you know, these Chinese firms have identified that and they recognize that and they are, um, you know, on the continent starting um to manufacture goods, um, for African consumers. And so, um, this is something that I think we will continue to see, um, we'll continue to see just more momentum in the manufacturing sector. And I, um, like I mentioned earlier, would love to see more made in Africa things. Um, and, you know, obviously first, um, we want African consumers needs to be met, but then I would, um, also love to see, you know, African manufacturers exporting, um, you know, goods made in Africa to the rest of the world. Um, and we will see a lot more of that, I believe, especially uh, when it comes to agriculture. So the third trend is Africa's infrastructure gap and the big push to close it. So the section starts off with a quote by Jack Ma. He's the founder of Alibaba. 
And it says, if the government does not have a solution to any problem, it is an opportunity. If people complain, it's an opportunity. And the authors go on to say that they recommend businesses adopt that same mindset when it comes to Africa's big infrastructure gaps. So instead of, you know, waiting for the government to intervene and to say like, okay, we're going to fix this problem. What a lot of people are doing currently is taking matters into their own hands and trying to solve um, some of the most pressing issues like access to power. Um, So currently there are actually 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa that lack access to power. Um, That is over half of the continent essentially, or about half of the continent, Um, you know, because there's 1.2 billion people And this presents major challenges uh, for a lot of companies, um, for people just in general. Um, You know, if you don't have access to electricity, um, the cost of doing business is just significantly higher. And for any business to work, you need energy. Like, energy runs everything, um, you know, period. And so... As a solution, a lot of companies are actually having to generate their own electrical power or they have backup generators on site. Um, So clearly this is going to cost a lot more um, than it would if, you know, there was reliable access to power. So this on like a positive note actually provides opportunities for entrepreneurs. Um, And there are a couple examples that are listed out in the book and one of them is of a company called Mcopa. So they are a Kenyan-based startup and they have sold um, solar power kits to hundreds of thousands of mostly rural households. And so although infrastructure um, you know, is lagging in comparison to a lot of um, even other emerging economies and you know certainly more developed countries, it still presents an opportunity for people to uh, come up with innovative ways to solve the issue. And so this trend, um, although it might be a little scary for people who are used to, you know, constant uh, access to power, it presents numerous opportunities to really um, close that gap. Trend number four is Africa's untapped resource wealth and new innovations to unleash it. And so as many of you know, I'm sure, Africa has always been known um, for the vast amount of resources um, that are abundant on the continent. Um, We have lots of arable land. We have, um, in some places, uh, really good climatic conditions. Um, that are conducive to agriculture. And so the book gives an example of Nigeria, which has as many as 30 million smallholders, so 30 million small-scale farmers, who produce more than 90% of the country's farm output. So these small-scale farmers are typically, you know, subsistence farmers who grow only enough for you know, just for their families, just for them to have enough to meet their needs and to feed their families. And as a result, even though Nigeria has 80 million, 80 million acres of arable land, it still relies heavily on imported food. And according to the United Nations, um, their food import bill is typically about $6 billion a year. So this also like was super surprising to me because first I didn't know that Nigeria had, you know, that much arable land. Um, but because of the fact that a lot of, you know, the, the farmers are producing just enough for themselves, um, they're still having to rely on importing a lot of the food, which is something that can be solved, um, you know, and there are actually programs that are trying to address this. One example of a social enterprise that's shared in the book is um, a Nigerian-based one called Baban Gona. So 
that in Hausa means great farm. So excuse my pronunciation if I didn't say that correctly. Um, but the founder of the social enterprise is a Nigerian American, uh, which was really cool to read. Um, so Babangona serves as um, a network for smallholder farmers and the members in the network receive development and training um, credit. Um, they get the agricultural inputs that they need um, to, you know, enable them to produce um their food and to have like higher yields they um give marketing support and just other like really important services and so this social enterprise um has actually been able to list more than twenty thousand farmers who on average have doubled their yields and increased their net income at least three and a half times um than the average farmer and so these farmers who are um, typically considered like high credit risks, um, they typically can't go to regular banks to borrow money. Um, But then a program like this actually provides like a mechanism for the farmers to um, borrow money and they actually have a 99.9% repayment rate on the credit that is obtained via the program. And so, Programs like this are like increasing access to capital and enabling these farmers to either expand their operations um, or use that money to invest in themselves or their families or what, whatever they might need at the moment. And so this trend I found super fascinating because um, I don't know the exact stat and I know it's probably somewhere in the book, but you know a significant amount of people on the continent are subsistence farmers and a lot of them produce just enough to feed their families because they don't have access to fertilizer or um, you know any sort of data really that could help inform um, them on the type of crops let's say for instance to plant um, you know depending on the climate that they are farming in. And so Africa has all this arable land and it seems like it's really a matter of making sure that farmers are equipped with the right resources and the tools to make sure that they have, you know, significant yields and, you know, successful harvests. And, you know, just thinking through this, you know, the more projective our farmers are, the less reliant we are on, you know, imports Uh, from other countries, food imports. And, you know, the less likely we are going to see, you know, famine and things like that happen. Um, And during times of drought, for instance, like that's what's happening in Zambia right now specifically, um, if you want to look it up, you know, um, because of, you know, lack of rainfall and things like that, like people's crops are failing. And then, you know, when that happens, it's like, well, you know, people don't have access to food and that's just really unfortunate. And so there are ways that we can go about making sure that, you know, farmers are empowered and farmers actually do have um, the tools necessary to make sure that they can feed, um, you know, themselves first and then um, hopefully uh, even more people. So the last trend of the big five is the rapid adoption of digital and mobile and the leapfrog opportunity. So technology adoption is a huge trend that could really accelerate each of the trends that are listed um, that I talked about before. And so for instance, in agriculture, tech firms really have the ability to lead the way as far as developing digital solutions that give farmers access to expertise and information on everything from um, weather to crop selection to pest control to management and finance. The more technology that people have access to, the more information you know they have, um, the more decisions they can make based off of data. Um, 
you know, they can make informed decisions because of that access to, to technology. And that is so huge. And so the book gives an example of Sarah Menker. So she is the CEO of Grow Intelligence. And what she is able to do with Grow Intelligence is provide that data to farmers to make sure that they are farming the right crops and they are doing it in the best way possible so that none of their efforts um, are in vain, essentially. And so she gives an example of where a small-scale farmer with the access to the right data can start to produce specialty crops for particular industries, um, like the beauty industry, versus you know just growing uh, maize or corn um, to eat. And so she talks about how this would you know, significantly increase the income of the farmer because, you know, prior to having this data uh, that says like, oh, you can actually grow, you know, this type of uh, crop and this crop um, is something that this one beauty company relies on to create their products. Um, You know, prior to that technology and that data uh, being accessible to the farmer, you know, the farmer would just continue with, you know, the same old saying, like the same crops and things that they were, um, that they have planted in the past, but then having access to this information opens farmers up to so many more opportunities to earn a living, um, and, you know, actually make enough money, um, to provide for themselves and for their families. So you really can't talk about technology adoption without talking about the internet and how powerful it is. Um, so currently, Africa's internet um, penetration lags behind a lot of other regions. Um, I think the stat is 28% of um, the continent's 1 billion people were online in 2016. And so that's about half the rate of the rest of the world. Despite that, Africa is still leading the way in digital payments. And there are actually already 122 million users of mobile financial services in sub-Saharan Africa alone. Um, That is many more than a lot of regions in the world. And actually, um, one in 10 sub-Saharan Africans has a mobile money account. So sending money, you know, um, just via the phone has been a norm in Africa for years, like before it really, um, I would say became the norm here in, um, like the U S for instance, like I just started using like Venmo and cash app, um, you know, within the last three, three years, maybe four years. Um, but I remember being back home years ago, Um, and people being able to just send each other money like super easily over the phone. So that is something that um, is definitely super, super um, important to acknowledge um, the fact that digital payments are so big um, and that only presents even more opportunity for more mobile solutions and more... um, opportunities to introduce uh, digital products um, and just really anything that is, you know, mobile first um, on the continent or anything that would require um, access to a mobile phone. And so the possibilities are endless. And I really, really appreciate how these trends are laid out um, because I feel like they are comprehensive and they address different things to watch, um, to really pay attention to so that you are making the right decision for your business or for your company. If you are seriously thinking about expanding to the continent, or if you're an already existing business on the continent looking to, um, you know, expand to other countries within the continent, like these are things to consider seriously um, and to be very, very thoughtful about. And so I really appreciate these big five growth trends and I can't wait to look back um, maybe five years from now and see 
um, how some of these trends like actually um, actualize. Um, and um, I really can't wait to just see all the innovations and all the technology that's going to be really driving business forward um, in the next few years. So the next part of the book is all about mapping out your actual strategy to expand to the continent or to expand your already existing presence on the continent. And so although I would love to explain this or share uh, what's shared in the book a bit more, it would take forever and this podcast episode would be super long. Um, so what I really took away from this, um, he, like they actually have, um, you know, um, one of the figures is like a map of the continent and it shows you how big the continent is. And it, um, shows how I think all of North America, all of China, all of India, um, and Europe, I believe like they can all fit on the continent, like outside of Asia, like Africa is the largest continent. And so you literally have to sit down and think like, okay, where am I going to be on the continent? Like what makes the most sense? And what I really loved, um, like one of the steps that he breaks down when you're mapping out your Africa strategy is to figure out and identify the ecosystem that you need to thrive. And so this section really stood out to me because the question that you should be asking is who will we work with to win? And I really love that question because it assumes that, you know, for you to be able to really do well, you're going to have to rely on other people, other already existing infrastructure, because for you to go to the continent and have to build literally everything that you could do, you know, you could do it, but it would be to your benefit if you found an already existing Um, you know, let's say manufacturer, if you're a clothing company, if you can go to Ethiopia and say, okay, we're going to work with this already existing garment factory, that's going to save you so much more time than you saying, okay, we're going to go to this other random country and build a manufacturing plant, you know, for our business. Like, why not go where the ecosystem is really going to help you um, you know, expand your business and establish your business and your, in your presence in that particular country. And so I really, really love that, um, because it forces you to really think about what exactly you want to do and what it's going to take for you to be successful. Um, and if you are able to do that, there's no doubt that you're going to be successful, um, on the continent, regardless of the type of business that you're starting. And the book also talks about innovation. And like I mentioned earlier, your business model might look different on the continent. It might be different in Nigeria and it might look completely different in, you know, Ghana. You know, even though you're the same business, you have to figure out what makes sense for each market. And so I really love the example that he gives of the, um, brand that's behind the Indomie noodles. And so Indomie noodles, um, for those that don't know, were brought to Nigeria in 1988. And within 10 to 15 years, they became a household name. So much that a lot of Nigerians, like, you know, just assume that they've just, you know, been a staple of Nigerian cuisine for years when you know, they were introduced um, to the market maybe about like 30 years ago. And so what this company, sorry, what this brand is able to do, they have been really, really strategic and thoughtful about their distribution. And so instead of taking like traditional approaches and saying like, okay, we're going to have these noodles available in grocery stores, they have made their noodles available everywhere like street vendors sell them um you know the little corner shops um you know in neighborhoods you know the little mom and pop um owned shops they have the noodles um you know if people aren't able to 
um, let's say, get to a particular um, kind of like this informal retailer to, um, if they're not able to get the noodles there by, let's say, by bus or by a bike, they have these distributors like actually walk because it's like, well, if you can't get there, you know, using a road, we're going to have you just walk and make sure that you are still able to deliver um, these noodles. And so they um, have been super, super strategic um, about, yeah, their distribution, uh, their marketing. They have like these school-based fan clubs where they are like, um, you know, engaging with like young students and, you know, having these fun clubs to uh, really create like these little um, super fans among like the young kids. And, you know, that's super powerful because if kids really enjoy your product, um, you know, obviously that's going to convince the parents to buy the product. And then when those kids get older, um, you know, the kids will continue to be loyal to that brand and continue to buy those products. And so, I really, really loved um, that example of, you know, being innovative and really thinking through how consumers access your product. Because if it's, you know, if it's a good product and it actually is addressing people's needs, um, you need to figure out how to get it to people, whether they are living in cities or they are living in more uh, remote or rural areas. So overall, succeeding in Africa looks like you playing the long game. Um, You know, the example of the Indomie noodles, they were in Nigeria since 1988, and now they are just this staple. Um, And I know they have a presence in other West African countries because that's how I learned about them from my West African friends. Um, And so... You know, you really have to be, um, you really have to be thinking not just about what consumers need today. You have to think about what they're going to be needing in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And that's how you win. You have a presence on the continent. You take your time to learn about the ecosystems that are present you learn about people you learn about their needs you learn about their pain points and then you figure out the best way to go about addressing those needs and so this book I highly recommend and the link to it is going to be in the description and if you took anything away from this please share it with a friend I really think it's important that we continue to change the narrative about Africa in general, but especially doing business in Africa, because a lot of people do recognize the potential that the continent has, and they recognize all those trends that um, are listed in the book, and they are capitalizing on the trend. And a lot of people are just not aware, like a lot of people just don't know. Um, A lot of us, you know, people in the diaspora, we we have an understanding obviously especially if you know some of us were born there or our parents were born there we have um a semi-decent understanding of you know what it takes to succeed but having numbers having data to back up why doing business in africa um can be revolutionary like having numbers data facts like that is super important because any decision that you make really should be based on evidence, based on data, based on trends, um, you know, so that you're not going into anything blindly. And so I encourage anyone who is interested in doing business on the continent, anyone who just has a general interest in business, I encourage you to share this episode with them, um, spread the word um, about you know, this book and about the fact that, you know, um, Africa really truly is, um, the next big growth market. And, um, you know, we need to continue to figure out ways to take ownership in that and not, um, let other people 
um, take advantage of it and, you know, ultimately win from it. And um, one thing I always think about, there was a video, um, an Instagram video by um, this business person. Uh, he's South African. His name is Wusi Tembekwayo. He's really cool. I recommend you follow him. Um, he had posted a video reflecting on the fact that so many uh, foreign countries, you know, Russia, China, um, they all have an Africa strategy. They all have a plan to either um, capitalize on a lot of this growth and momentum um, that Africa is gaining, um, or they have a plan to exploit it in some way, uh, exploit people. Um, everyone has a plan for Africa because everyone realizes um, its potential and that, you know, Africa is next. And so what is our strategy? That is a question that he asked in that video that I watched of his. He's like, so what's our Africa strategy? And like people in the comments were like mind blown because they're like, oh, whoa, what is our strategy? Like, how are we protecting our resources? How are we uh, protecting our people and ensuring that the beneficiaries of all of this growth um, are actually Africans, you know, are, are inclusive of, you know, people that are from the continent and not just, you know, people with, um, people from different countries and people who, um, you know, care just about making a profit on the continent. And so these are all things to think about. And I really, really, um, am interested in hearing from all of you, um, especially those who have, you know, expressed an interest in, you know, starting a business, um, in Africa or moving back to Africa. I think that's super fascinating. And, um, I look forward to just seeing what the continent looks like in the next, you know, 10, 25 years. And I hope to, um, somehow contribute to the growth, um, on the continent. And so, with that said, thank you for tuning in to episode 22 of Dear Diaspora. Be sure to share this episode uh, with friends, with family, anyone that you think um, needs to listen to this. And check out the book. Uh, link is in the description. Thanks for listening to Dear Diaspora. If you like what you hear, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. You can find us on Instagram at Dear Diaspora or visit our website at DearDiasporaShow.com. Thank you and talk to you next week.